in this amazing game, Svetozar Gligorich does the unthinkable. His opponent is Tigran Petrosian, who has the white pieces, pieces in this game. And as we know, Petrosian is known for snuffing out all of his opponent's counterplay before they ever have a chance of generating anything. Well, in this game, one of the very few, Gligorich is able to break that brilliant defense of Petrosian, and this leads to an amazing game, lots of sacrifices, lots of fun. Let us jump right in. Again, Petrosian has white, Gligorich has black. D4 is played, knight f6, c4, g6, knight c3, bishop g7, e4, and d6, playing the king's Indian against Petrosian, which we know on this channel is a very dangerous prospect. Petrosian eats the king's Indian for lunch. Bishop e2, castles, knight f3, e5, attacking the center, castles, and knight to c6, challenging that d4 square. Petrosian plays d5, the standard move, and now knight to e7, creating the standard Mar del Plata structure with this locked center. And basically, white wants to break with c5, black wants to break with f5, White has a little more space and a little more territory to work with, but black has white's king as their target. B4. This is the quickest way for white to play the advance C5. Um, it's known as the bayonet attack. It wasn't that popular for a while. Then about 20 years ago, Kromnik brought it to prominence and made a lot of people give up the King's Indian because of it. The reason it wasn't seen as that great a line before Kromnik was this move, knight to h5. Basically, black is able to clear the way for the f-pawn, but post the knight aggressively. Whereas in other lines, that knight needs to go to d7 because this knight is in the way in this line of the queen and bishop, so you can't just capture the knight. So that's why uh, this wasn't looked at as that great. Kromnik's idea, for the record, was rook to e1, knight f4, bishop to f1, and just playing around this knight and letting the knight block uh, this f file. Very advanced, crazy stuff. We won't worry about it. Knight to d2 is played from white, uh, putting pressure on this knight at h5, so that knight jumps into f4, uh, well posted, uh, threatening to exchange itself off with the bishop at e2. And Petrosian just presses on the queen side. He just goes a4. He doesn't worry about anything else. He's continuing to press his advantage on that side of the board. f5, standard. The standard idea from Gligorich, looking to open the f-file, bishop to f3, and now g5. So this pawn can go to g4, hit and irritate that bishop at f3. So Petrosian goes ahead and captures on f5, and knight takes f5. We see a normal a situation in the king's Indian. When these pawns are exchanged, white has the e4 square for his knights, but black has the d4 square for his. g3, immediately attacking that knight on f4. And a standard response here would be just knight h3 check, king to g2, and this bishop at c8 indirectly defends that knight. Um, but Gligorich decides to play a much more aggressive idea, and he decides to sacrifice that knight on f4, and he plays knight to d4, not worrying about that knight. And Petrosian says, well, you know what, I'm going to take it. And he does. He goes ahead and takes that knight on f4, and here Gligorich goes ahead and gets rid of that light squared bishop, the idea is, by this pawn going to g3 and exchanging itself off, these light squares around white's king have become quite weak. So he's exchanging off the light squared bishop, which can defend those squares, all the while his own light squared bishop is still on the board. Uh, the best move here was probably knight takes f3, and after ef4, rook to a3, and uh, black probably does not have compensation for an entire piece um, in that position. But Petrosian takes with the queen instead. Uh, I think he wants to have these knights controlling e4, one knight on the square, one knight uh, defending it. And that's why he didn't play knight f3 is my best guess. Um, and Gligorich goes ahead and plays g4. He doesn't take on f4 yet. Uh, he, of course, he's going to take with the e-pawn so he can open up this diagonal for his dark squared bishop. But first he kicks the queen back and gains more control over these light squares near white's king. Queen to h1 is played. Queen to d3 is playable, but maybe he was worried about bishop f5 gaining a tempo against the queen. Um, but queen h1 is kind of passive. That queen is sort of stuck on this h1 square here. Ef4 from Gligorich, opening up the diagonal for that powerful fire-breathing bishop at g7. And now, of course, these two pawns at f4 and g4 
in advance to attack White's king. Bishop to b2 to defend the knight and on c3, which was attacked. And here, bishop to f5. But these bishops are raking, controlling these key diagonal diagonals. What if he had played f3 to bottle in uh, the queen on h1? Well, then rook a to b1 to defend the bishop so he can move this knight, basically. Uh, bishop f5, knight c to e4. And then uh, h3, and white's queen might be able to escape in that line. Um, so he delays f3 and plays bishop to f5 and uh, places that bishop on an aggressive square. Rook f to e1 to the only open file, and now boom, f3. Rarely do we see a queen trapped on a single square, let alone Petrosian's queen. Very, very rare indeed. This might have been a good time for h3 to get that queen out. Uh, he plays knight d to e4, but that allows Gligorich to play this aggressive move, queen to h4, with very aggressive posting. The idea is the bishop can go to d4, so where the bishop and queen will attack the f2 pawn, and this rook at a8 can come in to, to e8 and activate itself on that square. So now Petrosian goes ahead and plays h3, trying to get some breathing room for that queen. And here, Gligorich makes a, maybe the strongest positional move of the game. He plays bishop to e5. This bishop is incredibly strong on this square. It serves two purposes, as we'll see. The first is to control g3. So if a piece were to land on it, he could capture. But also, he's going to use it to help escort a pawn to h2. Uh, he had, had to have a lot of foresight to, to see that. In this case, if hg4, then he would play queen takes with check. Uh, and if the knight tries to block, he could just take with that bishop. And then very quickly, the game would be, would be over. Um, and after king to f1, bishop takes knight. And uh, he, if he takes with the bishop, he'll lose this knight on e4, and he won't even have the extra piece. So, but if he takes with the knight, then bishop to d3. And again, it would be over quickly. So because of that, Petrosian plays rook to e3, trying to put some pressure on this f pawn after these pawns are exchanged. Gh3. Now he takes with the queen on f3, but Gligorich is able to play bishop to g4. And the rook is attacking the queen, the bishop is attacking the queen, and because of that, it's forced back to the h1 square. And now we see the second purpose of this bishop at e5, h2 check, and this bishop holds that pawn in place. Uh, if he plays king f to f1, then rook a to e8, and uh, black is very strong. Again, he's threatening knight takes, uh, bishop takes knight, which could create all kinds of problems for the defense of f2, because the only thing defending the, the the f2 square is this knight on e4, so it would be overloaded in this position. Uh, instead, Petrosian plays the king to g2, but now the queen goes to h5. We talk about those weak light squares, and he's aiming at those with threatening bishop to f3 check. So white plays knight to d2, so his knight can defend the f3 square, but now this powerful king's Indian bishop is able to shift one square and create serious problems. Bishop to d4, hitting the rook, and as sort of an x-ray is attacking that pawn at f2 along with this rook at f8. And the rook cannot move away, can't, can't move, excuse me, to, to e2, because if he moves to e2, then queen to h3 is checkmate. The rook has to stay in control of that h3 square, or, or he will get mated. So he plays queen to e1 knowing that that's a sacrifice of an exchange, if Gligorich wants it. But he'd rather develop his pieces, which he does immediately. Rook A to E8. If uh, white takes the rook, then after rook takes E8, uh, he's in big trouble because of the threat of, of queen to H3, among other things, as well as queening and bishop F3 check. And a queen to H1, queen to H3 mate, just as we have uh, seen. So knight C to E4 is played instead. To block that file, but bishop takes b2. And now white doesn't even have the extra piece that black sacrificed earlier, yet he still has all of the problems dealing with the attack. He plays rook to g3, Petrosian does, to pin the bishop at g4 and try to take advantage of that pin. Um, Gligorich, of course, can, can take the the rook at a1, but he doesn't want to do that. Uh, he doesn't want to weaken his own dark squares. That bishop's more powerful than that rook, so he wants to keep it, and he moves the bishop back to e5, threatening the rook at uh, g3. 
Petrosian plays rook a to a3. Um, he's prepared for black to take on g3, which he could have done. This was, Bishop takes g3 was fine. Uh, but instead, he plays king to h8, moving out of that pin, and maybe he could even move his own rook to g8 if he wants to. King to h1, rook to g8, he does want to. Queen to f1, and now he goes ahead, uh, Gligorich does, and takes that rook at g3, because after rook takes g3, he has this very strong move. Rook takes e4, rook takes knight, and in this position, one of the rare games where Petrosian was really attacked brilliantly in a King's Indian, he resigned, Petrosian resigned, and this is the reason why, it's this variation, when he, if he were to retake the rook, then bishop to f3 check, and then rook takes, queen takes, and that would be it. After king takes pawn, queen takes e4, he'd be up an entire rook, and uh, Petrosian is going to be mated very soon. A rare treat from the dapper genius Svetozar Gligorich, and where he took down the legend Tigran Petrosian. I hope you've enjoyed this game. See you again soon at Chess Talk. Goodbye.